Hey everyone, thanks for joining me. My name is Micah. I'm going to be doing the 50 state regulation of water policy lecture for you all today. Um, it is going to be obviously a policy oriented conversation, but I'm going to make sure that you're learning new information that will be relevant to you. Um, no matter if you are a policy debater, if you're a flex debater, or if you want to do more critical stuff, I think you'll learn something new today that will be useful to you. Um, it might, might spark a new research question um, or ideas for arguments. Um, it's just very important to have kind of relevant policy background before go diving into a new topic. So let's do a quick icebreaker because it's a small group. Um, so share your name, pronouns if you want to, school, your high school, and where you're Zooming from because I kind of want to know where you all are at. And you can answer one of the two questions or both. Um, what's your favorite beverage? It's not water. And or do you have a favorite body of water and which is it? So I'll go first and then I'll popcorn um, over to you all. So my name is Micah. I use she, her pronouns. I'm also in school. I'm a law student at UC Berkeley. I'm Zooming from California. That's where I'm from. And my favorite beverage that's not water is probably a smoothie right now, drinking lots of smoothies. And um, do I have a favorite body of water? Probably, probably the Pacific Ocean. The beach is nice. Um, and I'll popcorn over to our friends in Zoe's screen. All of you can, can popcorn off each other. Um, hi, my name is Skylar. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, we all go to Baltimore City College, which is high school. Um, my favorite beverage that's not water is root beer. Ooh, that's a good one. And my favorite body of water, I like like island oceans because they're really clear and like blue like the Bahamas. Beautiful. Uh, my name is Sylvia. I use she, her pronouns. I'm from uh, Baltimore City College. And my favorite, I guess I like tea, but I mean, I love tea as well. But tea is like good. Tea. Um, and my favorite body of water is, I guess, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, my name is Zoe. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. Um, we're all zooming from Washington, D.C. right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, my favorite beverage that's not water is probably either hot chocolate or orange juice. Um, and my favorite body of water is like the Finger Lakes up in, um, yeah, up, upstate. Okay, cool. I'm Seda. My pronouns are she, her. I go to city with them. Um, my favorite beverage is also tea. Um, and my favorite body of water is probably the beach in Japan. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Okay. And we'll popcorn to Noah. You can go for it. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Noah. I also use he, him pronouns. I'm, we're also from Baltimore City College. We're just in a different room. Amazing. <laughs> um, my favorite beverage that's not water, milkshakes. I like any sort of milkshakes. And I don't think I have a favorite body of water. I don't think I've thought of it that okay. much. Um, uh, dang, they're all here. All right, hi, my name's Jonah. My pronouns are he, him, also from Baltimore City College. And my favorite beverage that's not water right now is probably ginger beer, because that's what I've been drinking recently. Nice. And my favorite body of water is, oh no, and Chesapeake Bay, because it's dirty. <laughs> 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 nice. I love that you all are together and I love that all of you are from BCC one of my really good friends you you would not know him because we are older but he de also debated at BCC in high school so I am loving the BCC crowd here okay well we'll get into our content um so the goals I think there's a mixture of experience here but basically I want to help you all gain a general knowledge of comparing federal versus state policy, water policy and federalism. 
And I also want us to learn new information that will deepen our understanding of the topic, but also hopefully spark new research ideas by thinking about how the information can be used in states counter plan debates and practice debates that you have this summer and beyond. So like I said earlier, even if you're traditional flex or critical, I think you will learn something that is new to you today and will help you be a stronger debater on the topic. So this is just our roadmap. I'll start with a resolution overview because you know we're still getting used to the new topic and learning about it. Then we'll do a historical overview, very brief, and then a conversation about the current status of federal versus state policy. And then we'll talk a little bit about federalism, um, which will be honestly practical from a general standpoint because it's not really a popular argument in policy um, because it's hard to kind of establish a good impact scenario, et cetera. But from a policy standpoint, it's very important to understand what federalism is and its significance to uh, our government system. And then we'll kind of wrap up and talk about the state's counter plan and hopefully do a practice activity and end with a survey to see what you learned. Okay, so can someone just unmute themselves and quickly read the resolution for us so that we can kind of get it ingrained in our minds what this year's resolution is? Yeah, um, resolve, the United States federal government should substantially increase its protection of water resources in the United States. Thank you, perfect. So I've highlighted federal government to kind of ground our conversation today. We're talking about comparing federal government water policy and state government water policy. So, you know, just think of the resolution as our anchor for this conversation. You know, the affirmative team, if they're running a policy affirmative are gonna be, you know, advocating for something of federal, a, some federal government policy and the state's counter plan and state policy is relevant because it's something to contrast against our resolution. So let's do a quick guessing game and you can put throw your answer in the chat or you can unmute yourself but back in the day state governments used to be in charge of most water policy is that true or false i think it's true you think it's true let's see if there were whoops any other guesses in the chat or anything Cool. Okay. Well, I think you're right. You're, it's true. So let's move on to talking about that history. In early American history, the answer is true. Most water policy was primarily state controlled. The federal government was mostly focused on expanding westward and using waterways uh, to travel through water, not so much the use of water or anything like that. And for those who are interested in critical debates, you know, obviously early historical background of the United States is very relevant to a lot of critical literature, especially critical race theory or settler colonialism. So that's something to keep in mind an area of research that you might want to look into is kind of how the federal government kind of, you know, obviously colonized westward and a lot of that did involve using waterways in the United States. So that's something that you could look into more and, and rope in as part of your argument when understanding kind of this historical background of water policy. Um, in the mid 20th century, the federal government kind of started expanding their, their influence over water policy and started developing water resources for economic purposes um, and doing massive water infrastructure pro Project. So if you can see the picture, I put picture of the Hoover Dam, that's just an example of a very large water infrastructure project that the federal government started investing heavily into, right, like dams are used for power generation, electricity, um, they also started doing big projects, you know, for agriculture, so like insanely large like irrigation systems so that we can farm a ton of, of plants and food and vegetables and fruits, etc. Um, so kind of think big, big projects or something that the federal government started investing into related to water. And then this is something Caitlin talked about in her topic lecture, but, you know, later in the 20th century, so like 1970s, 
80s, so 20 years ago, the federal government started expanding into water protections with the Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, and the National Environmental Protection Act. So you can see how there was this transition of states controlling water policy and then the federal government slowly taking more and more of a leadership role in a lot of ways in water policy, creating this kind of, you know, back and forth, not necessarily a power struggle, we'll get more into that later of like how to, how we can think about these issues. But you know, there, there's always been this kind of, you know, who's in charge? Is it the states? Or is it the federal government? So now we can talk about the current status of federal versus state water policy. And to this day, like, you know, the history kind of shows us, there isn't a clear this is the national water policy. Water policy is a collection of laws at the federal level, at the state level, at local levels. It's a very, um, it's a, it's a very complex web of laws that make up water policy. Um, and you know, today the federal government mostly controls things like water use and resource management, or sorry, water supply, storage systems, water quality, while the states and local governments focus more on how we use our water, how we manage our water resources and allocating water rights. Um, and another thing yeah. is, is that the federal and state governments work together a lot. Um, so this was also touched on in your topic lecture, but with the Clean Water Act, you know, federal governments fund a lot of state projects. So there's that collaboration there. And uh, with the Safe Drinking Water Act, state governments are in charge of enforcing the standards that the federal government sets. So there is a lot of collaboration that exists as well um, in today's water policy. And that's something to keep in mind uh, when you're having policy debates um, regarding, you know, water policy is that it's because in debate, there's always like, oh, you have one side and this side, but the reality is, is that there's a lot of interwebbing, there's a lot of overlap between federal and state, and there's also a lot of collaboration. Um, something else that I thought would be great to talk about as a group about the current status of federal versus state water policy are ongoing environmental injustices. So you may be aware of like lead water crises, you know, that are going on in our country today, really key. Uh, famous examples are Flint, Michigan, Jackson, Mississippi, but you know it's really important to note that these are not the only cities in our country that face contaminated drinking water problems. And these crises are injustices because they disproportionately affect Black Americans and other minoritized Americans. And, and the reason why I highlight Black Americans is because I think this was an important a place to talk about, you know, the movement for environmental justice. This might also be very relevant if you're working on a critique for this year's topic that, you know, criticizes federal government, uh, the federal government and its policies and its history. Um, and that, you know, there are a lot of examples and instances where being in a predominantly black neighborhood is the most strong variable for predicting where you're going to find unsafe levels of environmental toxins. So it's going to predict better than class. It's going to predict better than other factors like property values. It's the most strong predictor would be race in a lot of, of in a lot of these environmental injustice cases. Um, for example, the environmental justice movement is said to have been born out of Warren County, North Carolina, which you can do more research about if you're interested in during the 1980s, so about 20 years ago. Um, and there were there were huge protests against toxic landfills in these predominantly black neighborhoods in Warren County, North Carolina. And hundreds of people were arrested. And that was kind of and they had, um, you know, some successful outcomes in their favor. And so that event was kind of known as the birth of the environmental justice movement, where we got language like environmental racism. Um, and so that is something that I wanted to talk about as well when we talk about federal versus state water policy, because environmental injustices uh, and the movement for environmental justice is ongoing. And a lot of, and why this relates to our federal versus state 
policy conversation is, is because a lot of policymakers argue that these um, contaminated water is a result of letting states have too much control over water policy and how to enforce federal standards. So, you know, lead water in particular would be an issue with the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is a federal law. But because states are allowed to enforce the federal law and come up with their own policies about how do we implement, how do we reach these federal standards, you know, it, arguably it led to cutting corners, you know, not doing things correctly. And it kind of ultimately led to the contamination um, of waters in towns like Flint, Michigan and Jackson, Mississippi. So this is kind of an intersection of, you know, issues that tend to be more relevant for critical debate, but intersects very heavily with policy issues as well of kind of, are we letting the states do too much? Like, is that part of the reason why this injustice is happening? Um, so that's something to think about as well. Okay, so there is all this back and forth of the federal government's doing this and the state government's doing that. And it seems like it can cause some serious issues so now I want to talk a little bit about what is the big reason that this is the state of water policy, you know, why is it so fragmented between federal and state governments, and the answer is federalism. So is anyone familiar with federalism, like what is it or what is it not that you can just like quickly share before we talk a little bit more deeply like what we know already about federalism. Well, the Federalists were an old um, party in the United States like system, um, but the Federalists believed that we should read the Constitution like directly as it is written, I believe. That's definitely part of it. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else before we move on? Okay, yeah, so the idea that, you know, federal lists were about, you know, reading the Constitution as closely as we could is definitely very accurate. And the point of federalism is the argument that the Constitution clearly limits the federal government's power. So what is federalism? Federalism is the balance of power between the federal government and state governments. The picture on the slide kind of sums it up for you, right? Like the argument um, is that the Constitution reserves like power for the states, right? We don't, the constitution says, we don't want America to be a government where the only government is the federal government. We want the state governments to have the power to make their own laws, to govern their own people. And that's what the constitution wanted. So that's kind of the idea of federal, federalism of reserving power for the states. Um, you might hear about it in the news as, you know, being called like states rights or state sovereignty. These are all federalism related ideas of making sure that state governments also have the ability to make decisions, um, make laws and govern the people that live in their states. A key historical example of federalism and the debates that it raises um, and, and kind of ways to critique it as well is historically, you know, many Confederate states resisted the federal government's abolition of slavery and they raised it as a state's rights issue. They were like, the constitution never said that the federal government could control all of us and everything that we do, right? Like states have the right to have their own laws about slavery if they want to. And so that's an example of when federalism is kind of used as a justification to uphold racism and anti-blackness in our country. So that is like, you know, a very historical and ongoing issue of how federalism gets kind of weaponized for in, and used in oppressive ways. So federal power is right limited by the constitution and it's specifically limited by a couple of clauses, but the most important one is the Commerce Clause. And it says that the federal government has the power to regulate economic activity. So that means that technically the federal government can only make laws um, that affect all 50 states if it has to do with economic activity. 
Um, and so what a lot of people don't know is that most federal laws are justified um, and are legal uh, through the Commerce Clause, right? Congress says, oh, we're allowed to make this law because it regulates economic activity. And so it can be anything, drug laws, employment discrimination laws, civil rights laws, business laws, right? All of these laws are justified and are legal and don't get you know, struck down by the Supreme Court because the Congress says, you know, we have the power to do this according to the Commerce Clause in the Constitution. Um, and environmental laws are also pretty much all justified through the Commerce Clause. So that's why, you know, this conversation is also relevant to water policy. So we're a small group, so we don't have to do breakout rooms, um, but we could do like a quick pros and cons of federalism based on what we've already talked about. And then we'll dive into a deeper conversation about some of the issues that I think you all might find interesting about federalism. Um, actually, we're kind of, yeah, actually we do have time. So let's just do like pros and cons of of federalism, just spitballing some ideas that you all might have. Do we like it? Are we not a fan of it? Do we think it's problematic? Like, well, how are we? How are we thinking? You can even share like a question about like, oh, like, was this a federalism ish? Partly a federalism issue, etc. Um, one con is probably like what you mentioned is that like since the state has some power, like it could be very like, difficult to like make laws if the state can like overturn it or just like not follow it. Can just not follow, yeah. Yeah, uh, like exactly what you mentioned before, states can abuse their power and make uh, really terrible decisions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, states can abuse their power and make really terrible decisions and not have that upended by the federal government. No, for so, sure. How do you feel like the state would know the demands of their constituents? Yeah, states know their constituents better is usually a pro, considered a pro of federalism. Yeah, you all are. Um, the states can better manage like individual aspects of uh, what goes on because the different environments are not the same. Yes, perfect. Okay, cool. So I like this point that we're raising too. Um, we'll go a little bit more on the next slide. I'll, I'll give you some examples that you can either research more or use in your debates, especially um, either if you're a policy debater or even if you're a critical debater, depending on how you frame these facts, facts and information that I share with you, can you can really use it to leverage your positions. So for example, you know, with federalism, like we said very earlier on, you know, fundamentally allowing states to have power was because, you know, the people who wrote the constitution wanted to prevent tyranny. Um, so an example from recently is a lot of people argued that federalism is the reason that a lot of, especially blue states, so democratic majority of Democrat states, um, were able to resist Trump era policies um, by using, you know, their power that is given to them through federalism. You know, for example, the Trump administration tried to, you know, stop sanctuary cities. And, you know, if you don't know what they are, but basically, you know, cities that choose not to cooperate with federal law enforcement when it comes to immigration issues and deporting immigrants. So sanctuary cities have laws that are like, our law enforcement doesn't cooperate with ICE, our law enforcement doesn't cooperate with the Department of Homeland Security, which are federal agencies. And so in that way, 
they can push back on federal power if they don't like what the federal government is doing. Um, you know, leaving areas of law up to the states can also alleviate impacts of oppressive structures. So for example, in my state, there's California AB 60, which um, allows any immigrant, even if they're undocumented to get a driver's license, right? So even though immigration is usually considered a federal government, like it's the domain of the federal government and they make all the laws about immigration, states can use their power and their ability to make their own laws to kind of be more immigrant friendly if they want to. Um, another example is marijuana decriminalization, which you all may have talked about on the topic last year if you were debating. But basically, you know, marijuana is still a controlled substance on the federal level, but many states, about 13, have decriminalized it in some way. Um, and so that's another example of states using their power. Um, other examples are brought up before, but states know their state better, so they can address maybe their unique needs better, right? They have specific resources, they have specific bodies of water, right? Not all states are coastal. A lot of states are landlocked. Some states have big lakes, right? Like there's all these different aspects to a state that an individual state is better equipped to deal with, maybe, depending on what part of the debate you're at. And then there's, you know, the flip side of federalism, which all of these positive things can also be negative things. So you said this earlier, um, and we put that on our list. But basically, when you let states have power, sometimes they do really horrible things, right? We see states that are uh, restricting abortion rights, which disproportionately affect low income women um, and minority women. Um, so that's kind of something that is a product of federalism as well. Trans rights are also being, um, you know, assaulted on in a lot of states. They're passing bills that discriminate against trans children and trans adults. Um, and that's also kind of a product of states having the power to make their own laws. And there's, you know, the issue of the lead water crisis that I brought up earlier of maybe we let the states have too much power to regulate, you know, clean water standards and they messed up. Like, look what happened. All these people don't have clean drinking water. And there are some issues that may or may not warrant uniformity. So a recent example would be like COVID shutdowns and the masks mandate. So the federal government kind of had their own like mask mandate, but you saw that a lot of states reopened before others or did not have mask mandates, et cetera. And, you know, depending on how you feel about that, you know, some people are like, shouldn't have just that been a federal thing that like all of us are just wearing masks and, you know, individual states and governors and counties like can't change that like in the middle of a pandemic. So that's something that's recent that, you know, relates to federalism and also things like pollution. So arguably it would make more sense for the federal government to set like, hey, this is like the acceptable amount of pollution from industry. It seems like it would be really silly to let states be like, no, like we think this much pollution is okay. Like, because, you know, if the science is there, then it makes sense to have a uniform standard. Um, so those are some things to think about as well and hopefully gave you some material that might give you uh, roads to research or building a critique for this year. Uh, because federalism around water policy can leak into these other issues, right? Like if we're in a time where the states seem to be getting away with a lot, and that might be, you know, something that's relevant to the conversation. Okay, so we'll, we'll move on to the state's counter plan now. That was like a kind of our general content. So I know there's a mixture of experience here. So I'll just do a quick review of a counter plan. I mean, even if we haven't read a counter plan like recently, or we do, or we don't, I think it's always good to review the basics. Um, can someone just read uh, the bolded and then the not bolded part? The negative team's argument that proposes an alternative policy proposal that is different from the affirmative team's 1AC 
comes with the net benefit, a disadvantage that doesn't lead to a negative it seems kind of an ambidescent so that creates the difference. Yeah, great. So on the state's counter plan, right, we're proposing an alternative uh, to the 1AC. And there are three main versions. And I think in your camp file, in your starter pack, you, you have two, the first two versions, and they're very similar. It's just a difference between how the counter plan text is written. And you can also swap out like solvency evidence that supports one or the other. But the first version is just that the 50 states should do X similar thing to the 1AC. Um, right, so if the affirmative is the Halliburton loophole, the 50 states version would be, you know, the 50 states can regulate fracking on their own. Um, not like exactly in those words, but you get the idea. Um, the second version that you'll probably see on this topic is the counter plan text that say, says interstate compact should do X similar thing or X similar things should be enforced through interstate compacts. And basically interstate compacts are a little bit different than like uh, a regulation or like a law that's passed through the legislator. Interstate compacts are contracts. Um, and so contracts are legal devices. They are enforced in court, um, but they are not like legislation. They are not policy, if that makes sense. It's kind of like a contract that uh, states make with each other. And if someone breaks it and doesn't follow it, it can be taken to court. Um, so that's kind of like a different version of the 50 states counter plan. And then there's also a third one, which we won't spend too much time talking about, but I put it here because you should just know what it is. If you aren't familiar with it, if you ever debate it and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't think I have any answers to this. You do. It's called the Lopez counter plan. Um, and the reason why it's called the Lopez counter plan is because basically there is a Supreme Court case called United States versus Lopez. And it's a very important federalism case because it's the Supreme Court case that clearly states that Congress can only pass laws that regulate economic activity. So um, the counter plan would basically argue that the Supreme Court should rule that the 1AC violates United States versus Lopez, right? That the 1AC does not regulate economic activity. So therefore it's unconstitutional. And then the states should do the plan, if that makes sense. And, and they'll, they'll kind of derive like a federalism net benefit from that by saying, hey, we're limiting federal power. The, the 1AC is too strong of federal power and we're gonna give this to the states. Um, so that's the Lopez version of the state's counter plan. You may or may not encounter it, um, but you do have answers for it. Most, most responses to states should apply to Lopez, but you should have a general understanding of how the mechanism uh, is different. And typical net benefits to the state's counter plan. Politics is sad, federalism is sad. Your starter pack should have uh, a politics disad, and then the federalism disad is inside of the state's counter plan. And so you can look at it through there. So we'll do a quick strategy overview before we move into the last part of our little workshop for today. But, you know, basically everything you've learned today is that water policy has always been a mixture of state and federal government policy. And when it comes to water policy, state policy and federal policy are both key, but we know that's not how debate always works, right? You have to pick a side. And so you have to be strategic about how you're framing things. So for the negative, you know, we want to emphasize specific solvency when we can, and this is true of, you know, on any topic, but, you know, specific is always preferable over general evidence. So if you have very good specific solvency that the states can do something that the 1AC does, then obviously that's what you should be emphasizing to your judge is that you have a specific solvency uh, for what the 1AC is trying to achieve and hopefully you have evidence for that. The counter to that for the affirmative is that their strategy should be that the federal government is key. And that can be for a lot of different reasons. You could say that the federal government 
has to be a part of it because of funding or the federal government has to be a part of it because they will take a leadership role. And that doesn't mean that the states can't be a part of it, but the federal government is going to lead it. Um, and you can also take like a truth over tech approach if you're affirmative, right, you know, and go for a permutation, right, because we've learned from the history and, and current water policy, federal and state policy is often intertwined. They often collaborate together. They often overlap with each other. Um, both federal and state governments are doing water policy in one way or another. And so you can kind of push this truth over tech idea um, if the negative is feeling a little bit behind on the truth aspect of the debate um, and are trying to out tech you, you can make arguments about how the judge should, you know, prefer like the reality of the situation and how you have evidence to support that. And obviously also answering the net benefit. So if you feel strongly about the permutation, you can say that the permutation solves the net benefit by avoiding the link to either the politics to sad um, or the federalism to sad, or you can say there's no net benefit and attack the net benefit, right? Like you would just answer it line by line on, on, on its flow and say, I've decimated the politics to sad, there's no net benefit. Um, in which case the judge no longer has a reason to prefer the counter plan to the 1AC, right? Because the net benefit is what makes the counter plan preferable, right? If, um, if there's no net benefit, the judge should presume that the 1AC is good enough, basically. So that's kind of like a general strategy overview of how you should be approaching the state's counter plan. Um, I can leave this up, but in a second, we're gonna start our practice activity. Um, we're gonna pretend that the 1AC was the Halliburton loophole app and the 1NC was the state's counter plan politics to sad. Maybe there were other off, but we're just gonna work with the state's counter plan and politics. And I'm gonna give you all a link to this, um, but basically we're gonna practice a 2NC in response to this 2AC. And you know, even if you don't know if you're gonna be reading the counter plan beyond summer, it's still a good time to work on you know, some skills workshopping. So getting to know a new file, getting to know a new topic. Um, I want your speeches to have proper line by line and strategic vision based on the information we learned about today, smart analytic arguments, you know, extending 1NC evidence, right? We're assuming that the 1NC was already read. So you can extend anything that's in the 1NC shell in your starter pack. Information that you learn from the lecture can always be used as smart analytics. Um, and I'll give you all some prep time and then I'll ask for volunteers to do some some practice speeches, but let me share the link with you all. Okay. So I will start a timer for about eight minutes. Um, it's more than you would get in a regular debate, but I, I do understand it's still a little bit of a time crunch because you might still be getting used to the files and the topic, but let's go with eight minutes and you should try and prepare a 2NC. Yay, claps. Okay, that was awesome. Um, really great so far, Zoe and Noah, that was awesome. Um, I guess what was something that people